Okay, let's pray, please. Father, thank you for this time to open the scriptures and to hear the voice of the triune God who has breathed these words forth for us. We thank you that Jesus came and that he said all the things he said and that by your spirit you help us to understand them. May we receive their truths with faith and love, lay them up in our hearts and practice them in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 is our scripture reading. Luke 13, 1 through 9, this is God's word. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. May God bless the reading of his word. There's a statement I remember reading a long time ago and I looked everywhere on all my digital stuff on my computer and I couldn't find who had said it but it was a statement saying that every believer in Christ should at least once a week meditate on the word eternity to sit and think about the word eternity meditate upon its meaning there is conscious existence after physical death that never ends when Christ returns to the earth At the last day, at his great second coming, our souls will be reunited with our physical bodies, and so will the departed souls of every unbeliever. And all will be resurrected and will stand in their feet before God on the day of judgment. Our minds cannot contemplate anything more serious than that reality. You remember last week I told you it's it's the collective insanity of the world that we're okay with the fact that we're going to die, that it doesn't bother us more than it does. Human history from the moment that God created until the day that Christ returns is finite. The amount of time between the moment of creation and the end of history when Christ returns is finite. The days after Jesus returns and the new heavens and the new earth are established will never, ever end. And those consigned to hell will be there by their own choosing and because of their own sin and their refusal to repent. Those who die in Christ with their sins nailed to the cross, dressed in Christ's righteousness, which they receive by faith alone in Christ alone, will go to what Scripture calls heaven. Heaven is not a state of mind, as many liberal writers have tried to say, really from the beginning, not just in the last couple hundred years, but it's not a state of mind that we achieve in this age. Heaven is clearly a place. We're told that Christ ascended to heaven. Jesus told his disciples specifically in the Upper Room Discourse, after the close of his public ministry, he taught his disciples in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. In Matthew 5, 5, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In 2 Peter 3, 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. 
Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And some of the most glorious descriptions that you could ever contemplate, Revelation 21, verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. When Paul spent about probably six Sabbath days in Thessalonica and planted that little church, and it was brutally persecuted, and they eventually they had to leave, and Paul was so worried about them, he wrote them two letters, and many of those Thessalonian believers had been murdered, had been killed uh, by Jews and by others there in Thessalonica, and Paul wrote them First Thessalonians and told them, that, told them this very basic teaching, and you wonder, really, they were confused about this? Yeah, they were. He wanted to make sure they understood that your friends that died in Christ, they haven't missed out on anything. They haven't missed out on the second coming, and neither will you. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You hear what he's saying? It's going to be a grand homecoming. All your Christian friends who died, all your Christian family, children that died in the Lord, you'll be reunited with them when Jesus returns in midair. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words, he says. Meditate on the word eternity. Think about it regularly. The Apostle John said in 1 John 2, 17, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Paul told the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, 31, For the form of this world is passing away. Why is this so important to us in an ungodly way, this world? Remember what Jesus taught in Luke 12, 15. Beware, he said, be on guard against every form of greed, against all covetousness, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Each person in this room has a very short, finite amount of time in which to live before your eternity begins. And each of us has talents and has abilities that God has invested in us, which he expects us to invest for him and his kingdom. Whether that means working hard at your job, at your regular job, as a godly example for others, as if working for Christ himself, loving a family, loving your church, loving your neighbors, speaking of the gospel to people, diapering and teaching children, loving your wife, loving your husband, loving your friends, etc. Each of us has possessions that God entrusts us with too. Life is so terribly short. And we're told in Ecclesiastes by the man who had it all, Solomon, you name it, anything you've ever desired in this world, anything you've ever wanted in this world, he had it. He said, man's boast in this world is nothing but labor and sorrow. We have labor and sorrow. You have joys and blessings, hardships and losses. If there's one attribute of the one true God that continues to astound and amaze us, it ought to be his patience. Does it not amaze you how patient God is? How patient he's been with you, with me, his long-suffering? Even the godly psalm writers, eight times that I counted in the psalms, ask those, those God-breathed hymns of Israel, they ask, Lord, how long? Lord, how long? God returns the question back to the world, too, to his own people again and again. In Exodus 16, 26, he says to his people, the, the Israelites that came out of Egypt, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? How long will you do that? Psalm 4, how long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Numbers 14, 11, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? God's prophet Elijah asked the people at Mount Carmel, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. The prophet Habakkuk cried out, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? How long is this going to last? We all ask it, and God asks back to the world, how long will you be fools? How long will you believe the lies about sin and about, that your culture tells you about race and everything else? How long? Here's your answer. 
until God has accomplished his holy purpose and glorified his name in all the ways that he chooses to do. God's patience is surprisingly deep and wide, but remember, what we're going to learn in our passage this morning is that God's patience has limits, too. Eventually, it will come to a permanent end, and eternity will begin. The very short period of finite human history before the big show starts is just that. It's very short. This world and all of its glitz and glamour and all the lies it tells you is very short, very transient, very passing. It's very shallow. It's very alien to the beating heart of the true Christian that longs so deeply to be somewhere else, to be with God for the glory and beauty of who he is, to be with Christ our Savior at long last in a place that's free of controversy, free of strife, free of sin, free of everything else that wasn't part of the good creation that God made. This passage here is intended to demonstrate what Jesus was constantly seeking to demonstrate, the need all of humanity has to repent right now. That's the message. You want to to give a label to the sermon? What's the point of the passage? Repent now is what Jesus is saying. He's saying repent today, right now. And we also see in the second half of the passage God's great patience toward those who refuse to do it, and who won't do it, no matter how many times you tell them. And so I've divided the text in this way, number one, point number one, the urgent need to repent or perish, that's verses one through five, and then God's patience with the unrepentant, verses six through nine. So let's look at the first part. Look at verses one and two of Luke 13. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices, verse two, and Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? There's a very real sense in which all of us are at all times living on borrowed time. We have no rights before God at all, none. And this is why we're not allowed to complain ever. We're not allowed to complain ever. It's a rather astonishing passage of scripture, Philippians 2, 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Every breath people take is only because of God's patience. He has the means, motive, and opportunity to give us justice at any moment of our existence. Every moment we live in this world apart from something taking our life away is only because of God's patience and his long-suffering. The people here told Jesus about some Galilean people who were probably in Judea for the Passover offering their sacrifice when Pontius Pilate for some reason, had some of them killed while they were doing it. And the result was that the blood of these worshipers themselves was mingled with the blood of the sacrificial Passover lamb, a a very sacrilegious, horrible thing to happen. There seems to have been an attitude here that dominated among those who lived in Judea, that the people there in Galilee, they're just backwoods country bumpkins who are not as good as us. And it's almost as if they're expecting Jesus to say, yeah, serves those Galileans right, huh? You know how ungodly they always are. But look at verse 2 again. Jesus says to them, do you suppose these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Knowing that that's exactly what they supposed. The clear implication here is that the people thought that very thing. They thought, yeah, they died that way. Their blood was mingled with the sacrifices because they were especially evil. They were especially bad. Now, Pontius Pilate, as we all know, he was a true bad guy. He himself proclaimed that Jesus of Nazareth was perfectly innocent several times publicly before he had him crucified. It's one of the most amazing things about the death of Jesus is the man who was responsible for declaring him innocent or guilty declared that he was innocent several times before he had him crucified. Pontius Pilate was arrogant. He was cruel. He was cynical. Remember when he invited Jesus, come in here to the praetorium, into the governor's house here. And Jesus says, all who are of the truth, listen to my voice. And Pilate says, what is truth? What is the truth? He couldn't stand Jews anyway. And who was this starry-eyed Jewish rabbi that the chief priests hated so much? Well, Pilate knew that they handed Jesus over because they were jealous of him. And Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent, that he had not done anything deserving of death, and nevertheless, he crucified him anyway. We know from history that what these people described to Jesus was typical of Pilate's rule as governor. One commentator wrote this, 
Reversing the policy of earlier Roman governors, Pilate had made a grand entrance by marching his troops into Jerusalem, carrying standards, bearing images that the Jews viewed as idolatrous. The populace protested vehemently against what they viewed as a sacrilege, and Pilate ignored their protests and ordered them on pain of death to stop the protest. But they called his bluff and dared him to carry out his threat of execution. Sane enough to be unwilling to massacre many people, Pilate was forced to remove the offending standards. The story is indicative of his poor judgment, his stubbornness, his arrogance, and his vacillation. Pilate again enraged the Jews by taking money from their temple treasury to build an aqueduct to bring water to Jerusalem. In the ensuing protest riots, his soldiers beat and slaughtered many of the protesters, end quote. Okay, so Pilate had a long history of dealing with the Jews. He could not stand them. Them and their weird religious ideas, he couldn't stand them. This incident here where Pilate had killed some Jews and mingled their blood with the blood of sacrificial lambs during Passover, that's very consistent with what we know from Pilate's character. He was brutal and insensitive. But the main thing to notice here is this. The theology of suffering so many of the Jews had at the time of Christ. The same errors dominate today. Their theology of suffering was very simple and mechanical. If something terrible happens to you, it's because you're a bad person. It's because you've done something to provoke it. Now sometimes, yes, God will bring temporal judgments against people for their sins. Some sins have built-in judgments that go with them. Adultery will often result in broken families. Theft will result in prison time. Promiscuity might result in venereal diseases. Murder will result in the death penalty. Sin brings lots of terrible temporal consequences with it. But what about people who don't look outwardly like they're sinning? Or at least they don't do anything that's notoriously or outwardly bad that people notice. What about them? The assumption that the Jews made at the time of, of Christ was this. If something bad happens, God's punishing you for a sin that you're hiding. Isn't that what Bildad and Eliphaz and Zophar kept saying to Job? Job, what in the world did you do? And Job keeps saying, I can't think of anything. Oh, you're a liar. There's got to be something, you pretentious jerk. In fact, one of them even says, you have not gotten even close to what you deserve because you're hiding something. And Job keeps going, I can't think of anything. I, not that I know it. Maybe God's visiting every iniquity I ever committed when I was a kid or something. And sometimes we do that to ourselves and we suffer, don't we? Haven't you done that? I have. There have been times in the last 10 years I, I, in prayer, I've asked God, are you visiting every simple thing I ever did in my youth that I never got caught for or something? Is that what this is about? The psalm writers prayed the same kinds of things. Psalm 25, 7, do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. The thing is, natural disasters and wars and famines and diseases seemingly kill and ruin people indiscriminately. When World War II happened, and so many civilians were killed by the, the carpet bombing of Germany and the German-occupied territories and, territories, and so many people were killed in, in Japan when we dropped those nuclear bombs, and by the millions of tons of tanks and bullets and artillery shells and landmines and everything else that people were using to kill one another. Listen, Christians and non-Christians alike in every age bracket were being killed by that war. Elderly people, children, toddlers, babies, adults, pregnant women, they were all being killed seemingly indiscriminately. When that tsunami hit Southeast Asia, when that tsunami off the coast of Sumatra that started because of that earthquake, when it hit Sumatra and Sri Lanka and, and Thailand, and remember seeing all those videos? That was in 2004 when YouTube was really starting to, to, to become a big thing and people were starting to upload videos of everything that ever happened. The estimates were that 250,000 people died that day. 250,000 people died that day. When September 11th happened, 2001, I had nightmares about that for weeks afterward. I had two little kids at home. I, I worked in a skyscraper in downtown Cincinnati. It scared me to death. Thousands of Americans died that day, had no idea that in just a couple hours they'd be standing in front of God. No idea. Hurricane Katrina killed thousands of people. There's no doubt that those worshipers from Galilee who were killed that day, they probably did not expect they were going to die that day. The tens of thousands of people in Thailand, Sri Lanka, and the other places, they were there on vacation for Christmas. 
They didn't think that the day after Christmas, after they opened all their presents and had a great meal, they didn't think the next day was going to be the last day of their life. But it was. 250,000 of them. Jesus used this incident to warn his hearers and to warn every person sitting here who has ever read Luke 13, 1 through 5, time is short and the days are evil. You and I live in a world of constant danger and God does not always protect and bless the godly and punish the unbelieving and the ungodly. And very often, have you noticed, the prophets point out, the psalm writers point out, very often it seems to be just the opposite. The godly, the righteous suffer constantly have problems, sickness, disease, cancer. And the wicked are doing just fine. Very often it's the godliest of people. They have trouble and they suffer while the ungodly thrive, prosper, are healthy. Their kids are healthy, successful, and they seem not to have a care in the world. But this idea that only the ungodly suffer, it dominates people's thinking even today. Remember the man born blind? John chapter 9, his disciples... Run into the guy born blind. What's their question? Who sinned? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he'd be born blind? I mean, how could, did the guy sin while he was still in the womb? He was born blind. Family had a child born blind. What a trial. What a heartache that would be. Even Jesus' disciples assumed that that could only happen because somebody had sinned. That can only be the result of a specific sin of some kind that's being punished. And I love Jesus' answer, John 9, verse 3. It was neither this man that sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. It was so he could be inscripturated in the gospel in John chapter 9 so everyone could read about it because he was going to illustrate the fact that we're all born spiritually blind and God has to, by his sovereign power, make us see. And that's why at the end of that, when he's talking to the Pharisees, he says, because you say we see your sin remains. You guys don't realize you're blind. If you could recognize your blindness, I could make you see. But because you walk around spiritually blind, telling the whole world, while you're spiritually blind, we see, we see everything, we see the truth, we are the ones, the guardians of the truth, therefore your sin remains. You don't see you're blind. It was a blessing for the man born blind to get his answer, to know it wasn't because I sinned, and it wasn't because my parents sinned either. If God is gracious to us, we might understand why certain hard providences happen in our lives or in our families, but most of us probably won't know this side of eternity, why most things happened. The book of Job, it ought to rid us of always looking for some specific sin of some kind, right? If you read the book of Job, you know not to do that. Jesus used the seemingly indiscriminate suffering and deaths of what looks like random people of all ages, he used that to awaken their need to repent. He used that to awaken them. The people telling this to Jesus, they really sincerely believed that those people that Pilate killed, who were murdered specifically because they were worse than everyone else, they really thought that. And Jesus' answer was astonishing. Look at it again at the end of of verse 2. Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, that they were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Tragedies and seemingly senseless accidents where people are indiscriminately killed like this, they're interpreted by Jesus. Listen to me, please. The tragedies that happen all around us, the diseases and people dying of this, that, the other thing, disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, whatever, they're interpreted by Jesus to be wake-up calls to the living. They're wake-up calls to the living. September 11th, terrorist attacks, they were greatly used of God to awaken many people to the reality that could very easily die at any moment unexpectedly. It happens every day. People are killed in auto accidents. People suddenly get serious illnesses with no cures. People's hearts suddenly inexplicably stop. People's brains suddenly have serious problems. In my own short lifetime, I've witnessed a number of shocking and stirring sudden deaths. When I was 24 years old, my father called me at work. I worked at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in Akron there, and my dad called me and said that a friend of mine from high school had been hit from behind on the sidewalk by a drunk driver. 
and he was in critical condition and not expected to live. And this is a guy I played uh, sports with in high school. And I called the hospital, and a woman answered the phone in his room. It was his fiance. I didn't even know he was engaged. My first child was about to be born when I got that phone call. He died two days after I got that phone call. I went back to Cincinnati for his funeral. It was pretty stirring to see him laying there in that casket. There was a family at the church I grew up in. I had a daughter who was very athletic, and she was kicking a soccer ball on her driveway with some friends, and she ran to go get the ball and, and landed on it. Kind of funny. I, I've done this myself, actually, where you step on the ball and your feet fly out from under you. She hit her head on the driveway pretty hard. Didn't seem to be that big of a deal. Three days later, she was dead in her early 20s. Remember what we looked at last week? Jesus chided his ears for being good at predicting a day's weather. Something very insignificant in the grand scheme of things. They were great at it. But being blind to the reality that all the miracles of Christ testifying to his divine identity and his saving mission they were happening right in front of them every day, and they could not discern its significance. Jesus tells them that when they have disputes with people, they, they settle them on the way there, on the way to court, on the way to the judge, so that before you get to the judge, you've already settled it, so you don't get thrown in jail for a long, long time. And that's a roundabout way of telling them an earthly illustration. Settle your sin issue with the ultimate judge before you appear before him and he throws you in jail. Settle your issue with God first, before the day of judgment. You know when a shower is coming, you know when it's going to be a pretty sunny day. How come you can't tell that your day to stand before God, dressed in the tattered filth of your sin, is coming? And then people tell Jesus about a group of Galileans whose blood was mingled with, by Pilate with the blood of the sacrifices of Passover right there in the temple and they were probably hoping Jesus would condemn those Galileans, as I said earlier, but Jesus once again seeks to turn their minds to the coming fact of judgment before God. He says, do you think those Galileans were worse than anyone else in Galilee? And he, he says, no, they weren't. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do we suppose the 250,000 people that died in Southeast Asia were any worse than anyone in this room? They were not. All men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why is Jesus saying this? He's telling them, be saved today. Repent today. Believe the gospel today. If God doesn't grant that to you, though, I can say that all day long. It's not going to affect you. But I'm still supposed to say it anyway, because that's the means by which he does it, right? Time is short. The days are evil. Repent and believe now if you haven't yet. The sin's not worth it. The pleasure is merely passing. It can't bring happiness they can't bring blessedness. Now, I want you to think about this. What does he mean by repent? When he tells these people to repent, what is repentance? Listen, repentance is a saving grace wrought in the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby out of the sight and sense not only of the danger but also of the filthiness of his sins and upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ to such as are penitent, he grieves for and hates his sin, as that he turns from them all to God, purposing and endeavoring constantly to walk with him in the, all the ways of new obedience. To repent, to repent is to sense not just the danger of your sin, that it will take you to hell, but also to see how filthy it is. To be re revolted by it. To be repulsed by the sin you see in your own heart. Think of what it's like to be filthy. You ever been physically filthy? When I was a kid, my dad told me that the longest he ever went without a shower was nine days in Vietnam. And he described sitting on a, um, a, a banana-shaped uh, helicopter where there's two propellers at the end. He used to, to ride around in those. He said, said he rode around with guys that, that were like 20 years old driving them, like 480 miles an hour. And he said it was like crazy. We thought we were going to die any second. He said he raked his fingers across the back of his neck and looked at his fingers, and they were just, the fingernails were just filled with sludge and, and muck and, and filth. That's what we are before God. We're filthy in our sin. And we have to see it. God, the Holy Spirit, has to open our eyes to see it. One of the greatest books ever written. If you've never read it, please read Augustine's Confessions. Read the Confessions of St. Augustine. This Christian believer who fought 
against his mother, Monica, who prayed for him his whole life until he was in his 30s. She prayed and prayed and prayed. Augustine's dad was not a Christian. Monica was. Her desperate tears and her untiring prayers for his salvation. Augustine of Hippo recounts his own conversion that took place in the 400s when he was in his early 30s in his autobiography. The whole biography, the whole book is a prayer. It's a prayer written by Augustine to God. It's him talking to God, giving thanks to God. The Confessions of St. Augustine, he describes his conversion this way. Just bear in mind that this man had been a womanizing, arrogant, violent, thieving, intellectual person filled with worldliness and hate and all the false ideas that were in vogue. Augustine thought he was really cool. He really did. He was cutting edge. He was an intellectual. He was a ladies' man. Listen to how he describes this. This is, this is a picture of repentance. But when a deep consideration had from the secret bottom of my soul drawn together and heaped up all my misery in the sight of my heart, there arose a mighty storm bringing a mighty shower of tears. What did he suddenly see? His filth. He suddenly saw it. He hadn't seen it before. He suddenly saw it. And he just started to cry. And he writes, I cast myself down, I know not how, under a certain fig tree, giving full vent to my tears, and the floods of mine eyes gushed out an acceptable sacrifice to thee. And not indeed in these words, yet to this purpose spake I much unto thee. And thou, O Lord, how long, how long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Remember not our former iniquities, for I felt that I was held by them. I sent up these sorrowful words, how long, how long, tomorrow and tomorrow, why not now? Why not is there this hour an end to my uncleanness? So was I speaking and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart, when lo, I heard from a neighboring house a voice, as of a boy or girl I know not, chanting and oft repeating, take up and read, take up and read. Instantly, my countenance altered. I began to think most intently whether children were wont in any kind of play to sing such words. Nor could I remember ever to have heard the like. So checking the torrent of my tears, I arose, interpreting it to be no other than a command from God to open the book. And he, he sees a copy of Paul's letter to the Romans on a bench in the garden. Now, I'm not advocating lucky dipping where you just open the Bible and put your finger down, and that's the answer to today's problems, that is extremely dangerous. But that's what he did on this occasion. Just flipped it open, his eyes fell down, and he read these words. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That's Romans 13, 13 and 14. And Augustine wrote this, No further would I read, nor needed I. For instantly, at the end of this sentence, by a light, as it were, of serenity infused into my heart, all the darkness of doubt vanished away. End quote. But what did he see? He saw that the life he lived was wretched, that he was filthy, that he was undone. And he just wept and wept and wept, and he even begged God, will you bring me forgiveness? Can you put an end to it? Remember the town prostitute in Luke 7? It's one of the most touching narratives in the whole Bible. God showed Augustine his filth and his sin. God showed that prostitute her filth and her sin. She saw it that day somehow in a, in a unique way. It was that last time to make a clean break, to turn from it, and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read the Bible, that is the call of God to you and the call of Christ to every man on earth. Repent! Repent! Turn away from sin and believe on Christ for salvation. Stop loving your sin, coddling it, making provision to keep it in your life. Stop reserving a place in your mind, in your heart, for those secret things that you know are evil and wrong. Grieve over and hate your sin. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane when he fell to the ground contemplating the agony that he would soon endure bearing the awful load of all of our guilt. That old prophecy from Isaiah 53, 6, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Holy Spirit shows us the filth of our sins so we will turn from it to Jesus, the one who alone bore its guilt and its curse at the cross. God changes the heart 
of sinners, from hating God and loving sin to loving God and hating sin. Yet even as true believers who have repented of sin and who truly do hate sin, the struggle to overcome it consumes us, and we fail so regularly and so badly to overcome it completely, don't we? This is the doctrine that's so unpopular and yet so true, so essential for people to understand. Listen to me. When Christian was on his way to the celestial city in Pilgrim's Progress and he dialogues with ignorance, ignorance asks him, Christian, what, what, are, what are good thoughts concerning ourselves? And Christian says, we have good thoughts concerning ourselves when we pass the same judgment upon ourselves that the word passes. And if you don't pass the same judgment that the word of God passes against you, you are ignorant. And he says, ignorance is thy name, and so thou art. We have to pass the same judgment. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. In his excellent book, I think there's a couple copies of it out there on the, on the racks, J.C. Ryle's book, Knots Untied, he wrote this. Is there no country on the face of the globe where sin does not reign? Is there no happy valley, no secluded island where innocence is to be found? Is there no tribe on earth where far away from civilization and commerce and money and gunpowder and luxury and books, morality and purity flourish? No, there is none. Look over all the voyages and travels you can lay your hands on, from Columbus down to Cook, from Cook to Livingston, and you will see the truth of what I am asserting. The most solitary islands of the Pacific Ocean, islands cut off from all the rest of the world, islands where people were alike ignorant of Rome and Paris, London and Jerusalem. These islands, when first discovered, have been found full of impurity, cruelty, and idolatry. The footprints of the devil have been traced on every shore. The veracity of the third chapter of Genesis has everywhere been established. Whatever else savages have been found ignorant of, they have never been found ignorant of sin. But there are no men and women in the world, are, are there no men and women in the world who are free from this corruption of nature? Have there not been high-minded and exalted beings who have every now and then lived faultless lives? Have there not been some, if it be only a few, who have done all that God requires and thus proved that sinless perfection is a possibility? No, there have been none. Look over all the biographies and lives of the holiest Christians. Mark how the brightest and best of Christ's people have always had the deepest sense of their own defectiveness and corruption. They groan, they mourn, they sigh, they weep over their own shortcomings. It is one of the common grounds on which they meet. Isn't that one of the common grounds on which we meet? I go to church. I go to church every Sunday starting when I was 18 when God saved me because I know I'm a horrible, wretched, miserable, poor in spirit, rotten to the core person who needs Christ every moment of my life to save me. The person who's unaffected by their own sin is in the gravest danger possible. All the Bible from the front to the back has producing that conviction of sin as its goal in order that people would see their need for Christ, his personal righteousness to justify them before God. Being good enough for heaven by works is not possible since man fell into sin, and Paul summarized it so well, Romans 3.19. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, and he goes on. When you see large-scale death, large-scale disasters, accidents, outbreaks of incurable diseases, that's a wake-up call to the world. That's actually, actually, I only heard one Reformed theologian after the, the tsunami in Southeast Asia had the guts to come right out and say it. The tsunami in Southeast Asia, I remember him saying this on his radio program, was an act of God's grace. And people got so upset at him for saying that. What do you mean by that? You're saying God killed all those people? Yep, every one of them. God killed every single one of them. Well, how can you say that's his grace? Because it's a wake-up call to the people that were there that survived it. You're going to die too. And you don't know when. Could be today, could be tomorrow. 
You know, I showed my, my kids way back in 2004, they were all real little, showed them all those videos of all those walls of water. One of my kids said to me, oh, I sure am glad we don't live near the oceans where, so God can't do things like that to us. I said, oh, you're not safe anywhere, trust me. Okay, we could be sitting on a fault line, and before I finish this sentence, we could all be in magma dead. So don't worry about it. God can get you anywhere. So you want to repent and believe in Jesus now. Jesus said that those disasters kill people, not because they're worse than you. Rather, the survivors of God's dark providences in the world, they need to open their eyes to their own mortality, and especially to their filthy, sinful, and undone condition before the holy God. We need Christ's righteousness imputed to our legal account to save us at the last day. We need the cross of Christ accepted in our stead and place by God so we'll stand guiltless before his throne. We need Jesus' personal righteousness as our own if we're going to die in the joy and comfort of knowing that we will go to heaven and not hell. God glorifies his grace in saving the worst of us. Maybe you feel guilty that you don't feel guilty enough. You ever feel guilty about not feeling as guilty as you should? Join the club. Yeah, Edwards said that. You need to repent of how lame your repentance is. And then repent of how lame your repentance over not being repentant enough is, too. It just goes on and on. Churches are hospitals for broken sinners, not country clubs for saints. And those people Pilate killed during the Passover whose own blood from their own bodies was mingled with the sacrifices being offered in the temple, and those 18 random people upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, they were not any worse than me or you or anyone who would ever read this passage. In the sight of God, we're equally fallen and equally in need of repenting. And there is an incredible urgency to the need to repent. Do not delay, because a tower might fall on you or me today and then eternity begins and it never ends and now we come after this urgency to repent you see a manifestation of his patience look at verses six through nine and he began telling them this parable a man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for it for fruit on it and did not find any verse seven and he said to the vineyard keeper behold for three years i have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. You know, Jesus' public ministry had one more year. One more year. And Israel gathered together there in Jerusalem, would scream and cry out to Pilate, His blood be on us and on our children. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. The meaning of the parable there is clear. The meaning of most of Jesus' discourses and parables in the coming chapters in Luke's gospel all the way up until Luke 21, it's going to be very obvious what he's doing. It's Jesus versus Jerusalem. Israel's the vineyard, and there's a direct allusion in this parable here to Isaiah chapter 5. Listen to the opening two verses of Isaiah 5. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. God gave them every reason to bear fruit and grow. But their sin, just like our own sin, made them bear no fruit. Israel was already apostate from the truth long before John the Baptist and Jesus arrived on the scene. John and Jesus both denounced them constantly as hypocrites. They both denounced them for being in love with and attached to their sin. The last year of Jesus' ministry, the people are steadfast in their opposition to him, steadfast in their lack of repentance. And in John's gospel, after the final astounding miracle, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead after he was dead for four days and was already rotting and stunk, they even plotted to kill Lazarus. Isn't that crazy? I mean, he just raised the guy from the dead. Obviously, death's not an issue for Jesus. As John the Baptist said early on in the Gospels, the acts of divine judgment is already laid to the root of the tree of Israel. And we know in all of this that God is absolutely sovereign. In fact, 
the hardness of Israel's hearts and our own hearts points up again and again the need for supernatural rebirth from on high. We need to be regenerated, born again. This means, the, the means by which regeneration takes place, however, is through these calls to repent. The call to the world, repent, repent, repent. Turn. Turn from sin to Christ and believe in him. Even the prophets long ago made the same appeals to Israel, most of which fell on deaf ears. Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. This is Yahweh speaking to Israel. And eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. That's Jesus' statement to the world. It's an amazing thing to be alive right now. It's an amazing thing to be alive right now, right here, in this very moment. The eternal state has not come upon us yet. But when it does, it is everlasting. Call upon Christ to save you while he's near. If a tower falls upon you, or when you're driving home, a car crosses the center line and kills you before your heart stops, the days in which you could have been saved will be over forever. So listen to Jesus. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And if you have repented and you are trusting only in him, rejoice. Rejoice and make sure that your life tells that story and that your mouth tells that story to others. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name and praise you for the gospel. We thank you for the, the saving grace of repentance. And we we who remember our pre-Christian days can identify with Augustine, that, that sudden overwhelming feeling of, of, of filth and being undone, and like that prostitute in Luke 7 where she was tearful. She saw the danger of her sin and the filth of it and wanted to be rid of it. Lord, help us to worship you well on the Sabbath day. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for repentance. Thank you for faith in Jesus Christ, who alone can save us. In his name we pray. Amen.